I'm Darlene Hurd. I'm one of the librarians at the Temple of Knowledge, otherwise known as the Library. <laughs> Our library director, Brent Roberts, is at the back of the room. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> thank you for coming. We would like to thank you all for coming to the program this evening. Uh, pro poetry of the Civil War tonight, and we have Tammy Holland and Bernie Quetchen back. And it's kind of amazing because these Civil War programs, they've been wonderful. And it's sort of bittersweet to think that they're coming to an end. Let's do it again. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. So the final program will be the music program next week, and I just want to remind you that it won't be in this room, it'll be in Sissel Hall, and we're going to have a light reception after the program next week. So please join us, and the bookmarks up here, they have a map on the back if you need directions to Sissel. You can always park in the parking garage, and that would be close to the Sissel Recital Hall. So. As always, Dr. Edgerton has his Civil War class sign-up sheet down here, so if you need to sign that, feel free to do that at the end of the program. And I want to remind you that we have the Civil War uniforms on display in the art gallery if you haven't seen those. So take a look if you need to uh, check those out. All right, and so, without further ado, we're going to start with the program for this evening, Poetry of the Civil War. So we have Miss Tammy Holland. She's a professor of English at Montana State University Billings. She's the author of two books of poetry, Breath in Every Room and When We Wake in the Night. Her work has appeared in many journals and anthologies and has been featured on the Writer's Almanac and American Life and Poetry. She was recently appointed Montana's Poet Laureate. And we have Dr. Bernie Quetchen back. He's an associate professor of English at Montana State University Billings, and he teaches courses in American literature, environmental literature, creative writing, and composition. His most recent book is an illustrated collection of poetry, The Hermit's Place, published by Wild Leaf Press. Bernie's poems, essays, and articles have appeared in a variety of books, journals, and anthologies. And in the Civil War, he generally sides with the Union. <laughs> so, <laughs> without further ado... <laughs> and uh, we want to extend our thanks to the library for uh, the series and for uh, being our hosts this evening. And to all of you for being here. And we have three great books to give away at the end of all this, so make sure you sign up. And don't go home early. <laughs> so our topic is Civil War poetry. And um, critic Edmund Wilson glibly dismissed the poetry of the American 1860s, asserting that the period of the Civil War was not at all a favorable time for poetry. He then goes on to talk about it for the next 40 some pages as if to apologize. But he's not alone in that assessment. Closer to the time of the war itself, William Dean Howells had compared the lack of quality verse produced by the war to the national debt it had left behind. Other observers, though, have not been so quick to reject that poetry. Walt Whitman and Herman Melville are the most obvious major figures to write Civil War poetry, although Wilson concluded of Melville that some people admire these poems more than the present writer. Mm -hmm. Shiloh finds Melville writing a traditional battlefield elegy, here reprinted, reprinted by Shenandoah, published by Washington and Lee University. Shiloh, a requiem. Skimming lightly, wheeling still, the swallows fly low over the field in clouded days, the forest field of Shiloh, over the field where April rain solaced the parched ones outstretched, the parched ones stretched in pain through the pause of night that followed the Sunday fight around the church of Shiloh. The church so lone, the log built one that echoed to many a parting groan, the natural prayer of dying foemen mingled there. 
foemen at morn, but friends at eve. Fame or country least their care, what, like a bullet, can undeceive? But now they lie low, while over them the swallows skim, and all is hushed at Shiloh. Walt Whitman's reaction to the Civil War are gathered in two sections of his life, uh, lifelong compilation, Leaves of Grass. And these sections are called Drum Taps and Memories of President Lincoln. Published in 1865 as a separate volume, the sections are entitled Drum Taps. The sections entitled Drum Taps include poems based on his informal service as a nurse in hospitals around Washington where, at first searching for his wounded brother, he ran to hospitalized soldiers and made himself generally useful. And this is a poem from the drum tap section of Whitman's book. A march in the ranks, hard pressed, and the road unknown. A route through a heavy wood with muffled steps in the darkness. Our army foiled with loss severe, and the sullen remnant retreating, till after midnight glimmer upon us the lights of a dim-lighted building. We come to an open space in the woods and halt by the dim-lighted building. Tis a large old church at the crossing roads, now an impromptu hospital. Entering Buckwood for a moment, I see a sight beyond all the pictures and poems ever made. Shadows of deepest, deepest black, just lit by moving candles and lamps and by one great pitchy torch stationary with wild red flame and clouds of smoke. <clears throat> by these crowds, groups of forms vaguely I see on the floor. Some of the pews laid down at my feet more distinctly a soldier, a mere lad, in danger of bleeding to death. He is shot in the abdomen. I stanch the blood temporarily, the youngster's face as white as a lily. Then before I depart, I sweep my eyes for the scene Fain to absorb it all. Faces, varieties, postures beyond description, most in obscurity, some of them dead, surgeons operating, attendants holding lights, the smell of ether, the odor of blood, the crowd of the crowd of the bloody forms, the yard outside also filled, some on the bare ground, some on planks or stretchers, some in the death spasm sweating, an occasional scream or cry. The doctors shouted orders or calls. The glisten of the little steel instruments catching the glint of the torches. These I resume as I chant. I see again the forms. I smell the odor. Then hear the outside the orders given. Fall in, my men. Fall in. But first I bend to the dying lad. His eyes open. A half smile gives he me. Then the eyes close, calmly close. And I speed forth into the darkness, resuming marching, ever in darkness marching, on in the ranks, the unknown road still marching. Memories of President Lincoln is centered on the monumental elegy when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. The appropriately named scholar, Jimmy Killingsworth, argues that Whitman's use of self-conscious symbolism, the lilac of the memory of Lincoln, and the associated grief, the star for Lincoln himself, and the hermit thrush for death's outlet song, shows that the once supremely confident poet could no longer trust to a spontaneous creativity. The poem concludes with these four lines. Comrades mine, and I in the midst, and their memory ever to keep, for the dead I loved so well, for the sweetest, wisest soul of all my days and lands, and this for his dear sake, Lilac and star and bird twine with the chant of my soul. There in the fragrant pines, and the seers, dusk and dim. Whitman also um, penned another well-known elegy, O Captain, My Captain. And we have discovered a selection of this performed by the Phoenix Children's Chorus. In a, um, an arrangement by Denver teenager Trey Cornell. And as you know, there's a close connection between music and poetry, 
and we were interested to see this modern team take such an interest in Whitman. As the recording begins, you will hear the composer, a 17-year-old young man, discuss his composition. You're going to have to give me one second to get this started, okay? <coughs> This, is, uh, this image up here is a, um, a manuscript copy of the poem I kept in my captain with Whitman's own corrections written in.
runs the gamut for me. What I just said. <laughs> Civil War poetry runs the gamut from patriotic calls to arms to the personal observations of soldiers and others impacted by the war. Faith Barrett, co-editor of the Civil War Poetry Anthology, Words for the Hour, that's one of the books that will be um, uh, uh, given out tonight, given out, um, points out that in the mid-19th century, poetry was widely read and recited in living rooms and schoolhouses and published in popular magazines and newspapers. The work of local poets would appear alongside such contemporary literary lions as Longfellow and Whittier. Whitman's hospital poems partake of a common popular motif identified by Barrett as the sentimental soldier, through which the soldier's youth and innocence are emphasized, linking the private losses suffered by individuals and families with the overall national trauma. Americans not only read poetry, but they wrote it and distributed it. Some of the writers were major figures in the ongoing conflict. Though it purports to be in the voice of Robert E. Lee, this piece of light, light verse was actually written by none other than <coughs> Lincoln dabbled in poetry, and soldiers often concluded letters home with verses they either wrote themselves or attributed to others in their units. Sometimes versions of the same poem with differing place references and attributions were found in letters from Union and Confederate soldiers. Also using a poem to sum up was Frederick Douglass, who concluded his first autobiography with a bitterly ironic hint parody aimed at exposing the hypocrisy of slavery supporting churches. And that poem begins with those lines, uh, Come saints and sinners, hear me tell how pious priests whip Jack and Nell. <laughs> 